Well, thank you very much for uh, having me today. Um, thank you for the invitation. So uh, just a few things, we'll just sort of go over uh, just a few things here. So we sort of talked a little bit about my background of 20 plus years in light manufacturing in 2007. I started facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group that meets every Friday morning, 10.30 your time via Zoom. When we went, when COVID hit, everybody went to Zoom. So we used to meet in person. The group's been around since the late 1990s. I took it over in 2007 when the leader of the group got a job. In 2008, I started uh, careerdfw.org, a 501c3 nonprofit organization to help those who are unemployed in the DFW area. Oops, let's see here. And uh, in, I've also written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search. You may not know, it is available on Amazon. In 2012, as Lenora said, I was invited to the White House uh, to meet other people from around the United States who had the same passion for what I do to help the unemployed. And uh, because of that, after that, about a month later, we were rebuilding the Career DFW website. Uh, I went ahead and split the website up into two sites. Career DFW specifically for people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, careerusa.org for everybody else around the United, around the United States. Um, Career DFW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have no full or part-time employees. I'm a volunteer. Everything I've done over the last 13 years has been as a volunteer just to help you, the unemployed, get your next great opportunity. So Career DFW survive on donations and anybody who buys the books, all the profits, profits from the book go to support Career DFW. Uh, we've got a LinkedIn group. Uh, you're welcome to join the Career USA LinkedIn group. You're welcome to join the Career DFW LinkedIn group. Uh, you don't have to live in the Dallas Fort Worth area to join that group. Uh, it's just that was the first group we started when I started the first website. We have over 13,400 members, and I'll talk a little bit later about why it's important to join groups uh, so you can network with other people. Uh, we have a Facebook page, a Career DFW Facebook page. Uh, we also have a Career USA YouTube channel. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, currently, there's over 290 recorded programs on there that you can go watch about your career, all sorts of topics that are available. All right, so today we're going to talk about four main areas to focus your job search on. Resume, LinkedIn, interviewing, and networking. First thing you have to do in your job search is you've got to have your resume ready to go. It's got to be, you've got to have a robust resume. After you do that, you've got to have your LinkedIn profile going. So we'll talk about LinkedIn. The third step is you've got to practice your interviewing skills. People spend way too much time on the resume, way too much time on LinkedIn, and very seldom do they spend any time practicing interviewing. A resume and or your LinkedIn profile will not get you a job. It only gets you a phone call. So you've got to be able to answer those phones. You got to be able to, you know, for the interviewing part, you've got to be able to answer the phone and do it so that they want to bring you in for an interview. And then the fourth thing we'll do is we'll talk about networking. Oops, there we go. All right. So I did this presentation last night for the people down in the Atlanta area. And I thought, you know, I need to, I talked at the end about how I'm just going to sort of skim the, skim the top of the layer here. So what I want to talk about today is the very top of the iceberg. And we could talk weeks and weeks about all the details and all the other things you need to be doing. So hopefully you'll just grab a couple things out of what we talk about. Uh, jot some notes down, try to implement what we're talking about, and that'll get you started here. All right, so the first thing we're doing is we're going to talk about resumes. Uh, people get analysis paralysis when they're dealing with resumes. They get hung up on, I don't have the perfect resume. You know, 20, 30 years ago, I remember when I moved to Dallas in 1987, and I was looking for a job. I typed up my resume. I took it to a printing place. They typeset it. I had a one-page resume that you couldn't change. And back then, that was all you could do. Nowadays, with computers, it's very easy that you should be customizing the resumes that you send out. So my question is, do you have a master resume? Make it your life easy. Sit there and put together a 5, 10, 15-page resume 
that has every job you've ever done, lots of bullet points, all the details, everything you would need to fill out a job application. And then when you see a job description that you're interested in, take that master resume, save it as, however your naming thing is to save different copies of your resume, and delete everything that's not in the job description because you want that job description to match up to the resume. Resume job description have got to match. So you never ever just want to send out a generic resume because you don't know what they're looking for. So that's why I say you need to be very, very careful. You want to make sure you keep the details in the job description. You've got to make sure that the bullet points on your resume has results, dollars, percent, numbers, something. Every, every bullet point has to have a result. Results sell, okay? If your resume reads like a job description, I did this, I did this, I was responsible for that. That doesn't tell me what you've done. It doesn't tell me what you can do for my company. Remember, a company has a problem. You're a problem solver. What is it that you do to solve problems? So do not blindly send out a resume. Do not post your resume on LinkedIn because you're posting a generic resume and people don't know, you know, you may, you may want to focus on something that you've done that hasn't, that's not in that resume. Consider a one page bio. I think everybody here should have a bio, an executive bio, a, uh, a marketing plan. I have some people talk about marketing plans. So there is a great book out there called B Shark. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. I think if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can actually download it to your Kindle for free if I'm not mistaken. But it's called B Sharp. You want the second edition. It's by Minna Brown. And uh, it's also here in a partner with Paula Asanoff. But the two of them, Minna speaks to my group on Fridays uh, once a year. The book is great. The first half of the book is all about how to tell people who you are, you, you, what your 30 second introduction is, how to put together a very effective 30 second introduction. The second half of the book is all about the one page bio. And she's got like 30 or 40 different bios in the back of the book. Uh, the sec that's why you need the second edition. The first edition didn't talk about a bio very much, but the second edition has all the details an extremely, extremely important document. This is what you want to network with. When you give somebody a resume, it says, help me, I'm looking for a job. When you give somebody a bio, you're just telling somebody who you are, what you can do, and let's have a conversation. Maybe, you know, let's see how we can help each other. All right, uh, if you fill out a resume online, I mean, an application online using an ATS system, applicant tracking system, you've got to be very careful not to use any special characters or any special formatting. You want your resume to be very easily read. There's well over 100 different uh, ATS systems out there. And some systems like certain things and some systems don't like certain things. So you want to keep your resume as plain and simple as you can. No header information, no footer information, no tables, because some, some, and you never know which ATS system you're dealing with, some can handle it and most of them can't. So just don't put in that. If you're having a table, just use the tab feature to go from you know, the first area to the second area to the third column or whatever. And you've got to make sure that your job application, that your, that your resume, that the keywords from, your, from the job description match your resume. Just very, very important because that's all an ATS system does is it's a keyword match. It's not looking for the most qualified person. It's looking for the person that has the most keywords on the resume that are in the job description, okay? And like I said, a resume doesn't get you a job. It only gets you a phone call. Um, you've got to make sure you focus on, re on results and accomplishments. We talked about this a second ago. Uh, if your job, if your uh, resume, bullet, if the bullet points on your resume don't, if they read like a job description, play the so what game. 
read that bullet point and say, so what? Oh, well, I did this and this was the result. I did this and I was able to accomplish this. Assign some dollars, just read the bullet point and say, so what? And you will be able to, it will help you to sort of refine and, and uh, quantify what it is you do. Uh, every bullet point, you wanna start with an action verb of some sort, okay? You can just Google action ver verbs and you'll find a big old list because that gives the resume some punch. Job uh, recruiters do not read a job description. They scan a job description. They're gonna, their eyes are gonna look at a couple things at the header, then they're gonna go into the first job and read the first three or four words. And then if they're interested, they'll keep reading, but otherwise they'll just keep on going. So I think it's real important that an action verb helps pull them in and with, a, uh, with an accomplishment and a result that sort of quantifies what it is you do. So we talk about resumes, career DFW and career say we've been putting on training since COVID started the first and third Thursday of the month. So today is the second Thursday. So we had a different topic and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but the first and third Thursday, every uh, Thursday, two o'clock, Eastern time, one o'clock central, we have an effective resume class. I have different, I teach one of them once a month and the other person, the third Thursday of the month, we have a, a guest speaker, somebody who's been doing resumes for years and years and years. So you can join us on our Career DFW Facebook page. We broadcast all of our Zoom calls or live on, the, on that page. Uh, you can go back and watch any of the prior ones and I'll show you that a little bit later on our Career USA YouTube channel. And I'll give you an email address at the end here where if you'd like to sign up and get on our mailing list so you can find out about these events, we'll get that to you here in just a few minutes. Okay, the second section we want to talk about is LinkedIn. So you got your resume perfected. Like I said, you get that 15, you know, you get your master resume done. Then what you do is you sort of take that information and that's how you're going to populate LinkedIn. So here's just some interesting statistics I happen to uh, LinkedIn just updated this like in the last two weeks because I think their earnings call just came out yesterday. They have nearly 800 million members around the globe or on LinkedIn, 180 million just from the United States. That's about 50% of the population, pretty amazing. Now, a lot of these people are not active. They happen to have a profile, but they're not active. Here's uh, just some more information, some more statistics that are uh, just were updated. 77 job applications are submitted each second through LinkedIn. 10 million people, over 10 million people use the open to work feature, letting people know that you're open to work, putting that green banner around your name, open to work. Use that, use that banner, let people know you're looking. 45 million people use, uh, 45 million people use LinkedIn to search for jobs each week. Four people are hired every minute because of LinkedIn. There are over 57 million companies listed and 120,000 schools are listed that you can go and uh, connect with people and find people in those organizations. So my question is, do you have your LinkedIn profile? Is it up to date? And is it fully developed? And by fully developed, we're gonna go into all the sections that you have to have so that you, um, that you need to do. And it's important that you let a company know how you can help them. As I said before, you're a problem solver, a company has an issue, they are trying to solve a problem and you're gonna come in and solve that problem for them. If you come with the attitude of what can they do for me, I'm not gonna, I would never hire you if that was the case. I wanna know how you can solve my problems. because I have an issue, whatever that issue is. So my first thing is, and this is just truly amazing to me, can someone reach out to you easily? Can they easily on LinkedIn, is your information in the contact field? Is your information in the about section? Uh, one of our presenters, we have four different, we do a LinkedIn presentation every Tuesday at two o'clock Eastern. And one of our presenters is a retained search consultant. He pays LinkedIn over $10,000 a year for the full-blown recruiting package. And he shows that to us. And we do a sample search 
you know, in Spokane, Washington, or wherever we, whatever city we feel like at the time for some generic position. And he always clicks on a couple of things. Were people open to work? Were people most likely to respond? And then he puts in the search criteria. And I will tell you that 75 to 90% of the people on LinkedIn that pop up in his searches do not have any contact information. I will tell you, Kirk wants to be able to pick up the phone. If he finds you, he wants to be able to pick up the phone immediately and call you because you're a hot prospect for him. If he can, if you're qualified, he wants to have that conversation. So you want that phone number and that contact information in multiple places if you can. So here's my LinkedIn profile. And I built my phone number into the banner. So that if somebody is searching, they'll find it there. Now they can click on contact information down at the bottom and it will go and open up the contact field and all the information's in there too. But I built it into my banner just to make it easy so people know who I am, what I can do, and how they can reach out to me. And I encourage you to do the same thing. On LinkedIn, hopefully nobody's done this yet. You're welcome to send me a LinkedIn invitation. Always send a personal note with a LinkedIn invite. Uh, my rule of thumb is I will not connect with you if you don't send me a personal note, okay? It's just sort of the way it is. Uh, Cause I don't know why we should connect. I don't know who you are, or where we met each other. Okay, so always, always send that personal note. Uh, just very, very important. And if you're on your phone, you can do it from your phone. Here's a screenshot from an iPhone. Uh, I think this more button has been replaced by a little the three hamburger, the little hamburger symbol. But if you click on more or the hamburger symbol, it comes up to a spot here where you can say personalized invite. And you can always send that personal note. All you have to do is just tell them, you know, I saw you here today at the Fang, New York Fang meeting. Um, you know, I hate the blue background. I wish you'd pick a different color instead of blue. Just whatever. I don't care. Just let me know that you saw me somehow. So if you want to connect with me, uh, please do so. All right. So to have a complete profile, you have to be, you know, you want to achieve all-star status. And LinkedIn will help you. They'll say, would you have this? Do you have this? Can you add this field? Do you have anything in here? But to be an all-star, to be at the top of the list, you have to have a current position, a location. So if you're in the New York area, I recommend you put the New York, you know, metro area. Don't say that you live on Long Island or, you know, unless you don't want to travel and you only want to stay in a certain area. Uh, you know, location is sort of important. Um, Put down, you have to have an industry, what industry you're in. You have to have a summary statement, which is now called the about, the about section. You have to pick at least five skills. You can have up to 50. I recommend between 40 and 45 skills. Uh, you have to list your education, some kind of education, and you have to have a photo. I will tell you, please have an up-to-date current photo. I was on a call with a group out of the Ohio, a career group out of Ohio, and when I'm, I've got multiple monitors. And so when I'm, you know, other people introducing themselves, I'm on LinkedIn looking them up. And I saw this one person and I'm going, well, it matches what they say, but the photo is nothing of like what they look like on the screen. What's going on here? So after the thing, I contacted him and said, oh yeah, well, that's my photo from college. I mean, it was 20 years old. And he didn't have half the hair that he has you know, that he had back 20 years ago. So have a current photo from the last four or five years, solid background if possible, no hand on the shoulder, no husband and wife photos reviewing your significant other, uh, no dog photos. It is okay. I don't mind if you have to use a photo of like a business logo, that would be fine. But personally, you want your picture on there, okay? People say, oh, I don't want my picture on there. They'll discriminate against me. Listen, Every one of us has been to a bar, we've been to a dance, we've been to some place, and we saw maybe our significant other across the room and went, well, that person's certainly attractive. I want to go meet that person, okay? So that's why you want a good looking headshot to put on LinkedIn, because if I interview you and you don't look like the LinkedIn profile, that's going to just be a problem. So I know I've, I've focused a lot on that. But I see a lot of 
really bad photos out there, a lot of photos that are just not up to date. Current position, most of you probably, I think, are unemployed. That's why you're here with us tonight. But if you are unemployed, how do you have a current position? This is what I recommend. In the, you create a job and you put down the job title that you're interested in, whatever that current, whatever that position is you would like to have. Or you could have, you know, position A, comma, position B, comma, position C. List a couple positions that you would be interested in. Then under the name of the company, put your phone number and your email address. Because that tells people, oh, I'm looking for this and here's how you can reach me. And then underneath for, you know, the description of the job, list three, two or three bullet points, three or four bullet points if you want, on what it is you do, what you can bring to another company. So that's why I think it's just uh, real important. So that's how you get that current job. And then when you get a job, just go delete that off your profile, okay? Because the gap won't make any difference. So that's how you have a current job and becoming an all-star status will move you to the top of the line when people do searches, will help move you to the top of the line. Okay, open the job opportunities. If you're looking for a job, you want to fill out this section. Now there's two, you know, you can pick up the five company names, you can pick a location, there's a couple other options you can pick, part-time, full-time, consultant, remote, I think there's a, a few other options you can pick. Um, but the big question that people always ask, do I want to put that green banner around my name that says open the world? I say yes, and here's why. If you're currently unemployed, put that green banner on there. If you're employed and you don't want your employer to know, you don't wanna do it, you just leave it open to recruiters. But here's why you put the green banner on there if you're unemployed. I would estimate from the people I've talked with in the DFW area that 50 to 70% of recruiters do not pay $10,000 a year for the full-blown recruiting package. If you don't have that green banner on there, there are rec there's a recruiting firm here in Dallas. They have 30 plus recruiters, all financial recruiters in this area. And none of them pay the, for the recruiting package. They just use LinkedIn general searches to try to find people. So they would never find you if you didn't have that green banner on there. They wouldn't know. So put it on there. And also your friends, your acquaintances, your contacts, they may be able to help. So put it on there. That, that's just my opinion. The about section. This is like 2000 characters. This is where you're gonna put a lot of keywords in there. And you're gonna talk about what you've done in your profession in your, and then you're gonna include your contact information at the bottom of there. You're welcome to go look at my about section to get you an idea of what I've done. You only want those about sections, paragraphs to be no more than three lines. Sometimes people say four, I like no more than three. So three lines, three lines, three lines, three lines. Uh, you write it in first person because it's like you're telling somebody, here's who I am. Um, I put my a call to action in there. You know, how can I help you? Reach, you know, here's my phone number and my email address. And at the very bottom, I put a bunch of keywords. You'll see I have a bunch of keywords at the bottom because I do that because the more keywords you have in your profile, the better chance you have of being found. And you want to make sure that your keywords appear, I hear three to five times is what I hear. So if you can use a keyword in the about section, use a keyword down uh, in a couple of your jobs, when people search for that particular keyword, it's going gonna, it's gonna to push you up and, and let you be found. All right, in the experience section, you're, you're going to list your job title. Now, if you have an unusual job title like chief people person or chief dollar counter, whatever you want to make it, uh, you know, that's not a job title from normal, but you, that's technically what the job was that I had. In parentheses, put down chief financial officer or whatever title or two titles that would be the same because that way titles, uh, all the job titles are a big search field, okay? So it'll help 
searching for somebody. So it's okay in parentheses, put the usual, use the title that would be in other industries or you know the generally accepted industry information. Um, be sure to include keywords from your profession, just very, very important. And results, results, results underneath there. Every bullet point wants to be result. How can you help me? Let me know what you did at this job and go, oh, I need somebody who can do the exact same thing. Uh, you've got to have your education on there, so put that on there. Uh, there's a place you can put awards, certificates, uh, certifications. If you've got, if you've taken a bunch of classes, I know financial, a lot of people have a class 60 or I don't know. There's a lot of certifications you have to take. If you've got those, list all those, put them down in the certification area. Any professional development you've done, any classes you take on a yearly basis, whatever it is, you can list those down there because you never know that may be a keyword that pops up that makes somebody search and find you. Uh, the skills section, you wanna have between three and five, uh, 40 to 45 skills. If you're in management and you manage people, make sure that your skills show, man, don't put down, don't pick management, but maybe put team builder or, you know, find some terms that are not generic terms, try to have some more specific terms that people may want to search for in that area. Uh, 45 to 50, you can have a maximum of 50, like I said. Uh, just be sure to go, just look at other people's profiles. Here's what I like to tell you. Go type, go and do, open up LinkedIn, go to the search box, type in the job title you want, see who shows up on that first page. Well, what kind of skills do they list? What kind of, oh, I've done that, I've done that. Well, you can add those skills and those keywords to your, to your profile. And then on the recommendations section, you need to have recommendations from coworkers or former bosses. You've got to have two of them that are current, okay? By current, I mean 20, 2020, 2021. 2019 is probably okay, but you probably, you need to get something a little bit more current. Uh, LinkedIn, by default, you only see two recommendations. I can't tell you the number of profiles I see, and I see, oh, they're most current recommendations from 2012. That's not going to cut it, okay? It tells me, well, either they haven't worked for a long time, or, you know, people don't like them because they're not getting recommendations. You've got to be proactive because you're selling yourself. You're a salesperson here. You're selling yourself into this to be able to do this. A couple of privacy settings that you need to consider that you need to do. Number one, you want to make sure you turn off viewers of this profile also viewed. Okay, so uh, I'm sure you've looked at LinkedIn profiles and you've seen other people and over on the right hand side on the column, here's 10 people just like Jeff. Well, why do you want to promote anybody else on LinkedIn? So be sure go in privacy and settings looked off viewers of this profile also viewed turn that feature off because you only want to promote you, not everybody else. And then you want to make sure you turn on, let recruiters know that you're open to new opportunities unless you're not looking for a job. Um, be sure to follow any company that you're interested in. I talked about the uh, retained search consultant that shows us the back end of LinkedIn. When he does a search for people, one of the options that automatically pops up just by default. So he'll do a search. We'll have 400 candidates that pop up in the thing and he starts going through them. One of the options he has across the top of his screen is people who follow my company. So if you're dealing with, in his case, he's an independent recruiter. So independent retained search consultant. So he didn't have a company, but if the person at Xerox was, uh, paying and they were using their full-blown package, they'd be able to say, oh, well, of the 400 people who were, we've searched, that we put in the search criteria, there are 80 people that are following Xerox. Let me look at those 80 people first because they may already know what we're doing. So any company that you're interested in or have applied to, be sure to follow that company because it will pop up in their recruiting package. Okay. You really, once you get everything set up, you really only need to be on LinkedIn 15 to 30 minutes a day, okay? You wanna do a couple of things. You wanna get rid of all the little red dots that are across the top of the screen. 
Okay, look at the current thing, look at any people who have applied, any people who want to, uh, to connect with you, any uh, news fees, any important things you need to look at. Look in though, clear them, read them, clear them out. You know, it, it doesn't take a lot. I spend about 15 minutes a day doing that kind of stuff and it makes my life easy. The other thing that LinkedIn does is it tracks everything you do. And one of the options that a recruiter has is that they can say, show me people who are active on LinkedIn. Because if you're not active on LinkedIn, there's a good chance that you don't have your contact information in LinkedIn. They don't want to use an in-mail because most in-mails probably never get read. So here's how you become active on LinkedIn very quickly, take five or 10 minutes. Uh, post, share, and like something, okay? Uh, posting earns you the most points. I recommend you post once a week. Find some kind of article and post it. There's a great website called feedly.com, F-E-E-D-L-Y.com. It's free. It's a news aggregator. It will go and there's all sorts of subtopics you can go pick from. Find something or find somebody who you admire and you want to reshare their post. You go, you copy the uh, link, you then paste it in the LinkedIn, write a comment about the story that you just, you know, that you popped in there. So post something. Recommendation is post something on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Mondays, people are just getting back from the weekend. Fridays, they're getting ready to go on the weekend, all right? So they're just trying to tidy things up. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is the best day to have a post read. The next most number of points you can do is if you share something and you share it with a comment. Oh, Jeff, I really like the uh, story you posted last uh, Monday about the 60 minute article on LinkedIn. Uh, the 60 Minutes did a story about LinkedIn and about the great resignation. I posted that on Monday. People have been commenting on it, and that gets them moved up to show that they're active. Next thing you do is sharing something and you don't put any comment on it gets a little bit less number of comments. And I've heard with the daily with a comment daily, that's eight care eight words or more. That's what you know. LinkedIn doesn't tell you a whole lot. But I've heard through the rumors that if you hear, if you if you comments over eight words that counts, and then by just in the just like three to five posts every day. If you find something, just click like, 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 and move on. Now, if you're in a group, if you're reading objects or stories in a group, you can only like them. The only place that you can share is on the main news feed. Okay, so I just want to warn you about that. When you don't see a share button. It's because if it's in a group, the whole group already knows about it because it's been shared to that group. You don't, you can't reshare from one group to another. All right, so that gets you active on LinkedIn. Always reply to any LinkedIn in mail or connection request. Even if you don't want to connect with somebody, thank you. You know, I've got, I get people who want to connect with me to sell me uh, insurance or obviously they didn't read my profile. Because if they did, they would see that Career DFW has no employees. We have no payroll. I don't need a payroll processor. But people still want to try to reach out to me to try to sell something on LinkedIn. Remember, LinkedIn is not to, you don't want to sell an item. LinkedIn is here to help you find contacts, okay? Take it offline. So if you get a LinkedIn in-mail request, just say thank you, no thank you. Uh, if you get a connection request and you're not interested, you can just hit, you know, hit the deny button. Don't. Don't leave it in, in limbo forever and ever. So we do a LinkedIn presentation every Tuesday at two o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Central. Uh, we have four speakers who rotate through on a monthly basis. Uh, two of them are uh, career coaches. One of them is uh, has a marketing company who uh, markets uh, and he teaches LinkedIn. He, he does about a hundred presentations on LinkedIn every year on how to use it to be effective in what you do. Uh, and then the retained search consultant that shows us the back end of LinkedIn. So you can join us any Tuesday, uh, great information. One of the four speakers does not allow his presentation to be recorded. So if you wanna see his presentation, you've gotta watch it live when it happens. All right, third section we're gonna talk about is interviewing. You've got to be prepared for an interview. 
your resume's done, your LinkedIn's done. Now you get that phone call. What are you going to do when they call you up? So every bullet point that you have on your resume, you have got to have a story. I recommend you write them down and you put them on index cards. Okay. And what you do is the top of the top line of your index card, you put down what the bullet point is. And then underneath it, you don't put a detail writing, but you put down, here is the situation, here is the task, here is the actions that I took, and here is the result. That's the STAR method. You can also use uh, SAR, you know, as a, a situation, action, result. Uh, you can flip it around, you can do RATS, result, um, action, situation, you know, you can flip it, whatever, but have something, write it down because by writing it down, it, it burns it to your brain better. If you sit there and type it out on a computer, it's not gonna be as effective. And when you're going for a job interview, you can have the cards with you and when you're sitting out in front of the parking lot, you can sit there and just quickly go through them and go, oh yeah, they may ask, oh yeah, here's my story, here's my story. And you're able to go through and sort of remind yourself what it is you're doing. So, you know, consider doing that. You've got to make sure that any answer you give, especially on a Zoom call or Microsoft Teams or whatever they use, no more than 45 to 60 seconds. Uh, when you were meeting people in person, we used to say 60 to 90 seconds, 90 seconds maximum for an interview or for a question. On the internet, 45 to 60, if you can keep it 30 to 45, even better. Just mention the result. Here's what the act, here's what I had to do. Would you like to know more? And if they want to know more about something, they'll ask you or let you know, you can give them the option to tell, to go into more detail. I'm sure everybody's done a lot of great things and you want to tell some great stories, but be sure here is the situation, here is the task, here is the action I took. And they're not hiring the team, they're just hiring you. So what did you do to be part of that team? And here is the result. And the result is what sells. I saved the company $2 million because I found a flaw or whatever it is, you, you know, that's what's gonna help you. All right, be prepared for the following couple questions. Um, why do you wanna work here? I know there's a recruiter uh, who talks to my group once a year and she says, I ask every candidate, I don't care from the bottom position to the C-suite when I'm interviewing people, well, why do you wanna work here? And if they don't have a good answer, they don't move on. Okay, they didn't get, they don't go past the gatekeeper, past the recruiting department. So have an idea, whatever that answer is, have a compelling 30 to 45 second thing of why it is you wanna work there. How much did you make at your last job? And I know a lot of places you can't ask the salary question anymore, but you need to be able to be prepared to talk about that. So the two couple words that I like is fair and equitable. I'm sure that whatever this position pays is gonna be fair and equitable or, you know, I've done some research on the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and according to their data, for the job title in this area, the pay range is between X and Y. I'm sure that whatever your pay is going to be fair, it's going to be fair and equitable. So, you know, who's not going to pay something? Well, I, I guess there are companies out there that will not pay fair and equitable, but, you know, you just... Uh, do the best, you know, you have to just do the best you can. And then why'd you leave your last job? And why'd you leave the job before that? And why'd you leave the job before that? The key to this is don't talk negative about any jobs that you've had in the past, because it will, if you talk bad about a prior job or a prior boss, I'm thinking, well, you're going to talk bad, bad about my company when you leave. You're going to talk bad about me or something. So you've got to make sure you keep it positive. Very, very important. Uh, and we've got a whole workshop that talks about that. And I'll tell you where you can find that in just a few minutes. All right. One of the things that uh, I love and I've been pushing, I, I took this from somebody else who I, I've known. Uh, he His thing was 10 plus one, that you always want to have 10 questions ready to ask in an interview. Okay, 10 pertinent questions. Please don't ask him what keeps you up at night. Okay, don't ask that question. But 10 questions about the business, about what he does. How did he get to where he was? 
And then the important thing is you want to try to get five of those questions in during the interview because you don't want to wait until the very end when they say, well, do you have any questions? The worst thing you can do is say, well, no. So the second best thing is, yes, you ask some important questions. But most important to me, right after you give your opening statement, and we have a whole thing about opening statements, and I'll tell you, I'll show you where that is in a little bit. You want to, you want to ask the person you're interviewing with. So I've read your job description. Can you tell me what the three or four most important things is that you need me to accomplish in the first six months I'm here? Because when you ask that question at the beginning of an interview, you now know what they need done. Now, you may get four or five answers from person A, and then when you have the next round of interviews with person B, they may have five or six other things that they want you to do. And you get the person to C, and they've got three other things that they want, they think you should do, because that's what's most important to them. So just, I think it's a great question at the beginning of an interview to help you gauge what they want. So, and then the last, the plus one question is always ask for the job, ask for the next step, ask to be pushed ahead. The, uh, the statement that I like to use the most is, how do I compare to the ideal candidate? Don't, I don't care about the other candidates. I don't care about how do I compare to the other candidates. I don't care about them. How do I compare to the ideal candidate? I just, I, I think it's a great question at the very end of an interview to sort of ask before you sum up. Okay, uh, be sure at the end of the interview, ask what the next steps are gonna be. Who will I be contacted with? If I don't hear from you uh, in the next week or two, if they say, oh, this is gonna be another two week process. So if I don't hear from you from uh, two weeks from Monday, is it okay if I contact you? And then contact them on that Monday, okay? Uh, be sure to express even a greater interest in the position. Remember, if you ask that question at the very beginning, tell me the three or four most important things you need me to do. At the end of the interview, you can say, well, you know, at the beginning of the interview, you said you need somebody who can do X, Y, and Z. I've done this here. I've got four years experience doing this, and I can do this for you. So take what you've learned at the beginning and sum up at the end and let them remind them this is what they said and how you can do it. Show that enthusiasm. Be sure to ask, you know, advance to the next step. Um, or if you're willing to go for it, just say, I'm ready to go. Can I start Monday? Uh, we had a person in uh, who I, I, I know this guy, and um, he actually at the interview said, you know, I saw a desk down the hallway. Would that be my desk? I can start Monday. And they stuck him in the conference room, and they all walked out, and they came back about 10 minutes later and said, all right, we're going to offer you a job, because he was bold enough to go ahead and ask for it. Okay, so if you think things are going well, if it's something you want to do, you've got to take the bull by the horns and go for it. All right, well, here's a really cool thing that's open to anybody on the call. You're welcome to uh, take part of this. You may want to write down this email address, dallaspitcrew at gmail.com. We offer here in the DFW area, and I don't know of anybody else doing this in the country, we have a group that's gone online. We used to meet in person, but now we go online. They were offering practice interviews every Tuesday night at 5.30, Wednesday at 1, and Thursdays at 3 o'clock. Those are all central time. I guess I need to modify my card to say central, but uh, they're all at central time. You, What will happen is you send them a resume and a job description. And it doesn't have to be, it can just be a job description that you've seen online someplace. You know, ah, this would be fun to interview for. And send it in and you will get a panel interview. There'll be three people interviewing you. And it'll be about a 40, 45 minute interview, about 15 or 20 minutes of feedback. The whole thing lasts about an hour and 15 minutes. And you need to do this three or four times to get really good at it. Okay, it is hard. It is, you can be, you could be an excellent interviewing. You've hired lots of people. Put yourself on the other line here. It's really different. Practice, be ready, because if you're comfortable doing it in front of a group of people who want to help you, you're going to be much more comfortable in front of 
an actual team. We've had one, I can know the most people have ever taken. We had one person who did it nine times and he got the job he wanted. He wanted a job at LTV in the aircraft. He wanted to work for somebody who manufactured aircraft. And um, he got a job at LTV over in Fort Worth and was just very, very excited. But he practiced, he practiced, he practiced. Very important. So Dallas Pit Crew at gmail.com or you can go to DallasPitCrew.com and get more information about it. It's totally free. Totally, totally free. All right. Well, in leading to that, uh, we have an interview session. We have an interview. We do interviewing every Wednesday. So LinkedIn on Tuesdays. Uh, interviewing every Wednesday, two o'clock Eastern time, starting this year, um, up in, in 2020 and 2021, we actually had two people who put together a 13 part workshop on interviewing. And I'll show you those sessions in just a second. In 2022, in preparation of getting back together in person, um, you can actually watch now a real practice interview happen. So you can see what other people are doing, the good, the bad, the mistakes, you can see you get to hear the follow up, the uh, what they did good and whatever, and then we'll have some open interaction that anybody on the line can watch. It's only on Zoom, uh, no Facebook Live. Uh, it's not recorded. The only person who gets the recording is the person being interviewed. So this gives you an option to go back and look at what you did and go, ooh, better not say that because you just, it's all these little things that you just never picked up. I've, I've done over 140 of these as a, interviewer. Uh, and I learn something every time I do it because people will say something. It's just like, oh, the way they said that was absolutely perfect. Or wait a second, better not do that. So it's a great way to go watch if you're able, you know, come join us every Wednesday for that. All right. So here's that 13 part workshop that we've put together. It's about 20 hours of material. It's totally free. It's on the Career USA YouTube channel. But if you'd like to, you can subscribe to that. Um, and if you do, when you do that, every time you post a new video, it will be, you'll get an email saying that we just post a new video and here's what it is about. So the way this breaks down is the first five sessions are all about what to do before the interview. So we talked about, uh, you know, how do you analyze a job description, dealing with video interviews, dealing with star stories. I mean, I think hopefully everybody here knows what a star story is or whatever the other example is, but you know, how do you do that? The next five sections are all about what do you do during the interview? Opening, you know, interview openings, very, very important. Closings, how to follow up, how do you discuss compensation? You know, how to be sure to ask questions during the interview. How do you demonstrate enthusiasm during the interview? Um, so those are the second five sessions. And then the last three are some advanced topics about, you know, how to shorten your job search by doing informational interviewing, uh, the very last one is interview, avoiding interview crashes. The two people who put together this presentation have done hundreds, if not thousands of interviews. And here are just some common things that we see happen all the time in the interview process. So they're all out there. You're welcome to go view them at your leisure. Uh, if we talk about any handouts, just shoot me an email. And I'll be glad to get those handouts to you. All right, the fourth section we're going to talk about is networking. You don't want to spend all day in front of a computer. Now, this was really back when we could get out in person. Nowadays, you're sort of stuck in front of a computer or the grocery store and then back in front of your computer again. So uh, you don't want to spend all day on job boards. You know, Indeed, Monster, whatever the job boards are, I think it's really, uh, really, really difficult to do. But 5 to 10% of jobs are found online. 15, 10 to 15% are found using a recruiter. And if you're, a if you're in a certain technical field or very high up, sometimes retain search recruiter is the way to go. But 75 to 80 percent of jobs are found through networking. And three fourths of the jobs out there are never, ever posted because they go, oh, you can do this. You know what? We've talked about hiring this person to go do that. We haven't posted the job yet. You know, maybe you're the person for us. Um, you want to network into a company. OK, if you can be referred, you have a 50 percent chance of getting an interview. If you just fill out the ATS, the, the applicant tracking system, fill out the online job board or you send a, in LinkedIn, you, you just apply online, the quick apply or whatever, you have less than a 2 percent chance of getting that interview. 
Okay. And the reason for it is not because recruiters aren't looking at your resume or your, you know, the resume you put in. It's that if there's 300 people applying for a job, the recruiter who could be a 22 year old kid who just got out of college and this is their first job in the HR department and really doesn't know what it is you do, or what the job is, they went, here's a job description, find me 10 people who can do that. And the person's just trying to find the first 10 people. And as far as soon as they find the first 10, so maybe they get through 100 people, they don't even look at the rest of them. Or the ATS system does a bad job of matching because you don't have keywords in there to get your name to the very, very top. So if you see something you're interested in, go ahead and fill out the online application, but do that at nighttime. Don't waste time during the day. But then get on LinkedIn. How can I find somebody at that company? Call the recruiter up if you can find out who it is and tell them, I just applied for XYZ job. Uh, I am qualified and I can help you out. I meet, the, I meet the qualifications in that job. So I think it's just very uh, helpful. Uh, I know that recruiters, if you do that, you have a good chance of being talked to them. If you can get somebody in the company to take your resume to the hiring manager, you have a ch better chance of getting that phone call. So whatever you can do internally to get inside, to get somebody to you know, move you along, you have a much better chance. Reach out to everybody you know. This was interesting. Uh, a couple of weeks or last Tuesday, we had a uh, one of the networking groups I was in. Uh, we were debating how long is it okay to say Happy New Year, and we concluded that for the month of January, you are allowed to tell all your contacts Happy New Year. Now, um, you know, I, I reach out to everybody you know. Take the time. Wish them a Happy New Year's. I just think it's now's the time to do it. You just never know, and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to connect with each other. Here's a very interesting thing, and this is something I highly recommend you're doing. If, if you're not doing it, this is a great little tool that um, a couple of different people have come up with and modified it. Uh, you want to reach out to everybody you know. Now, you may want to do this in two different emails. One email goes to friends and family. The other email goes to all your professional contacts. Okay, you send it out blind copy so nobody knows who else is getting it. But what you do is you send this email out every three weeks. I think three weeks is perfect. One, this other person said every four weeks. But the first paragraph is, I want to thank the following people for their help over the last couple of weeks. And just throw some names in there. Maybe nobody helped you, but they don't know. But they'll go, oh, I want to see my name on there. So maybe I'll help them next time, OK? The second paragraph is, as a reminder, I'm looking for a position as an X, Y, Z. And if you need to put a little definition, put a little definition if you need to. Paragraph three is, if you know anybody who works at the following companies, Citibank, Golden Sachs, whatever, list three or four companies. Do not list, I'm looking for somebody, if you know anybody who would have a position like this on Long Island, because locations don't matter. Give company specific names because you have a better chance of that connection happening. And then the very last paragraph is, if there's anything I can do to help you, please reach out to me and put your contact information and off you go. If you do this every three weeks, I've heard that people who are in sales, they need to make that personal contact four to seven times before it's really gonna hit, okay? So the first time you send this out, you may not hear from anybody. The second time you send it out, you may hear from a couple people. The third time they go, oh yeah, Steve's still looking for this. Let me go see how I can help him. So the more consistently you do this, it will be, I think, a very, very effective tool. So we talk about networking. We did today, we had a networking session today about how do you network? So the second and fourth Thursday at two o'clock Eastern, uh, we talk about networking and I've got, we've had 23 different speakers. I mean, networking is networking, but everybody has a little bit different way to do it and things that you should be doing. So uh, second, fourth Thursday, we have speakers who will talk about networking. You're welcome to join us on uh, the Career DFW Facebook page live. You can watch this live on Zoom. Uh, you can go back and watch it on the Career USA YouTube channel. I loaded today's session up there. 
a couple hours ago. So I think YouTube's probably got it ready to go. We can go back and watch it. So uh, just you're welcome to come join us for that. Here are the, oh yeah. So there's 24 different, 23 different speakers that are out there that we uh, had last year. Uh, we're cycling back through these people again. If there's anybody else out there who'd like to be a presenter and talk about how they networked and what they do, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me and you're welcome to have a one hour presentation and, and tell us how you do it. I've got a job seeker here who I've known for several years. Uh, he's putting together a presentation right now about how he's looking for a job. He's currently out looking and he's gonna put together a presentation and share here are the, his tips and here's what he's been doing. So if, you're, if you wanna share, you're welcome to uh, please reach out to me and let me know. All right, a couple bonus points and we'll wrap up here. Number one, uh, as I mentioned, Career USA YouTube channel, we've got over 290 workshops that are on there. LinkedIn every Tuesday, interviewing every Wednesday, resumes first and third Thursdays, networking the second, fourth Thursdays, uh, the Dallas, North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group every Friday morning. Those are all central times. So if you eat a late lunch, grab a lunch, come join us at two o'clock Eastern time or in the morning and you know, grab a donut or bagel and have a bagel and have breakfast with us. And, you know, come learn, take an hour every day, get a little education on how you can help uh, move your job search along. On the Career USA YouTube channel, it looks something like this. I recommend if you first call it up, all the videos are just all jumbled up because it defaults to the video, to the home page, and it's just a jumbled mess. Click on playlist is the easiest way to find. Uh, all the uh, every video I put I put up on one playlist. So then you can then pick networking, LinkedIn, resumes, interviewing, whatever it is. Don't click on the video, but click down below where that purple arrow is, where it says view full playlist, and then up will come a list of all the different topics. And you can I mean so everything in interviewing. Here is you know discussing compensation asking questions, building rapport with the interview. You can go back and then watch any one of, the, any one of those episodes if you'd like to. Um, here's something I'd like to share. If you're not early, you're late. Five minutes, to me, five minutes early is on time. On time is late. Um, back when I moved to Texas in 87, I used to work a third shift. And when the person came in first shift and they were five or 10, 15 minutes late, I was annoyed. Well, I eventually became her supervisor and I fixed her of coming in late. Okay, so, you know, to me, it's always been a little pet peeve. Try to try to be on time, try to, you know, uh, it's just respectful. And I hear people, you know, if you're driving to an interview, get there early, you know, get there a half hour early and just sit in the parking lot or sit at the Starbucks close by just so that you know you can get there on time in case there's a traffic accident or something on the way. Always include your contact information in an email. So we talked about earlier about that email going out every three weeks. Be sure at the bottom of your email, and every email you put out, you need to have your contact information. So Jeff Morris, Manufacturing Operation Professional, Sigma, uh, Certified Six Sigma Greenbelt. I put my phone number. I put my email address in my signature line because I want to make it easy because a lot of email programs nowadays, they just show a display name they don't show the email address. So if somebody wants to hit reply real fast, I mean, they can hit reply, but if, even if they want to copy this information and put it into their Microsoft, into Microsoft Outlook, they can just cut and paste and stick it in there. I put my LinkedIn address in there because sometimes I don't know, well, who is Joyce or who is Steve? And if you have your LinkedIn thing, I can click on there and go, oh yeah, I, I recognize that face. That person was on the phone call when I was with the people up in New York. And I'm always promoting Career DFW and Career USA. So just to sum up, please uh, join the Career DFW and Career USA LinkedIn groups. Please follow us on Facebook. If you follow us on Facebook every time you do, uh, your phone will buzz and it'll say, you know, Career, D Career DFW is now live. And you can watch the presentation right on your cell phone uh, from Facebook. If you subscribe to our Career USA YouTube channel, every time I post a new video, uh, you'll get an email saying it, uh, what's on there, and you can always go back and watch it. I know I have a number of people who go, they can't watch it during the day, or they had an interview or something, they'll go back at nighttime and, and they'll watch the presentation or watch it over the weekend. Uh, if you'd like to join the Career USA mailing list, you're welcome to do so. 
uh, you send an email to Career USA, the plus sign subscribe at groups.io. Um, this is a great way it's for me, great way for me to be able to get the information out. You'll never be spammed, but what we, we you will get four or five emails a week. The emails will include the topic of the day, the title of the day, and most importantly, the Zoom link and Facebook link for the day. So that way you just pop open the email, click join, and boom, you're right into the Zoom meeting if we're, you know, whatever we're broadcasting that day. I'll put this up here in just a second. Well, just got one more slide. Uh, there it is at the very bottom. If your group is looking for a speaker, if you know another networking group that you're part of in the New York area or wherever you're located, and they're looking for a speaker, please feel free to reach out to me and, and contact me. I do all these for free. I just want to share the word. The thing that I like to ask everybody out there is if you know somebody who's unemployed, please let them know about Career DFW and CareerUSA.org. Um, usually my presentations are about 90 minutes and I actually show you the websites. So if you go to the websites, right in the very middle of the websites, you'll see the free career training that's going on as well as all the other uh, things that we've got listed on there. If you know of a networking group and it's not listed on my website, please let me know so I can add it so I can share that kind of information. So that's what I have to say. I'm done talking at this point and um, can open up for any questions people have. I know I think I saw a few questions run through the uh, uh, chat box, but I didn't go back. So if somebody wants to pop them back out, we can, we'll be glad to talk about them. Questions, questions, comments, suggestions? Anybody hate my blue background? Should I change it to another color? <laughs> hey, Jeff. Um, this is Howard Ty. I have a question that's probably a little long to type. How do you um, tell if you've been approached by a recruiter who claims to uh, be on a retained search that they want to, they want your info, they want your resume, they want, you know, they want your phone and all that. But then a few weeks goes by, it looks like it's nothing more than a ghosting exercise where they simply want to collect your resume for their right. database. Well, here's, here's all right. So I talked about this at the very beginning when we talked about resumes. Never send a resume to anybody unless you have a job description that you can match up the resume to. Sending that generic resume is a waste of time, even to a recruiter. And if the recruiter gets mad and goes, well, you didn't send me a resume, I'm not gonna deal with you. You just tell them, I don't wanna send you something that's not gonna get me an interview, okay? I would always send a bio, the one page bio, the executive marketing plan, whatever it is. Uh, I would always send one of those whenever. Um, Never send any, you know, you don't give out social security numbers. You don't need to tell people your street address, phone number, email address. And if they want a copy of the bio, they're welcome to have it. And your bio has got that information on it anyway. Until they can show me something and you have a conversation about a specific job, you know, you're right. There are a lot of people out there that are just trying to collect information and do nothing with it. And a lot of recruiters, and this a good a good retained a retained search recruiter, the, the truly third party recruiter that's getting paid up front to hire somebody, is legitimately trying to find somebody to fill the job because they've already gotten paid part of your salary to hire you and bring you in. That middle people, those um, recruiting firms that are out there, a lot of them are just trying to find resumes that they can then send the companies going, here's my, here's candidates that I know of. Do you have anything that maybe would work? So that's why uh, you just gotta be careful. You have to know what to ask recruiter. I, there's a section on my web, on the Career USA website that talks about recruiters. You can type in uh, four questions to ask a recruiter. You know, what kind of recruiter are you? How many puts, P-U-T-S, have you had with this company? Because if they haven't put anybody in the company, then you know they're not, you know, they're just wrong trying to find out what's going on. If they don't tell you what the company is. They don't, if they can't share a partial job description and tell you exactly what the job is. They're just fishing. So 
there are a lot there are a lot of bad recruiters out there especially you know you get the call centers from india that are calling you up going you know the same thing you can tell because you hear in the background a uh, hundred other people thank you very much i'll move on but there are some very good retained search you know, consultants out there okay any other questions for anyone Actually, I, I do have a question. You're talking about the importance of including results, numbers, percent changes, et cetera. What if you do not actually have them? I didn't really think to take them with me when I had left the company you know, 12 years ago or 13 years ago for two jobs ago or I have them from the last job. Do you recommend estimating them? Or yes, what? estimate them. Nobody's going to check. Nobody has ever called up a company and go, well, Jeff put on his resume that he saved your company $4 million by doing X, Y, Z. Is that true? No firm is ever going to answer that question. What they will just do is say, yes, the person worked here and here's what they were making at the time. Now they're all they can confirm. So yes, just estimate what it is you do, what you did, what the results are. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, please. Um, Go ahead, Shirley. Okay, let me put my video on. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. This is awesome. What do you do when um, I work for couple companies that no longer exist, right? They dissolved. Uh, my career was awesome. I happened to leave before they dissolved. Uh, went on dissolved for good reasons. Uh, they were bought out. But uh, a company says, can we contact your prior employers, right? I don't have those contacts. <laughs> All right, so here, here's, yeah, this, this is a very common problem. You can go back, if you look at my resume, for the companies that I've worked for since I've been here in Texas no longer exist. I mean, they're as in not bought out by somebody else, but gone, closed down, bankrupt, out of business, kaput. So the only thing I can do is I always save my 1099 tax form, not the tax document, but just the little receipt going, here are the wages that I made that year at the company. So if they want to see that I work there, I have a little envelope that has all of them back as far back as, as I was throwing away old tax documents. I save, I tear that part off. I throw the rest of it away if it's past 10 years. So that's how you can prove. Now, if a company has been bought out and they're now something else, that's what you put on your resume. You list, you have two choices. You can list the old company's name and then in parentheses put purchased by XYZ in 1999, close quotes. It just tells people who it is or list the new company name and, and you can put in there acquired, you know, the company that you worked for back in the same date. So there's two ways to, you know, you can throw that out. But yeah, if a company, I have one company that, has, that was acquired, they actually changed the name twice. So whatever the most popular name is that people would know is what you want to put and then in the parentheses you know clarify how that company now owns the company that you're you know they used to work for great thank you any other questions go ahead yeah. robert yeah hi jeff thanks very much for your presentation it's really been fantastic i i have two questions first one relates to job title so previous organization i worked for has since upgraded all of their job titles. They, they were notoriously strange and not sort of market comparable. Do you go back and adjust up? Um, you know, for example, associate directors are all now directors for the same job, et cetera. And so that's the first question. And then the second question, with all of the sharing of email address and phone number, what is the privacy impact of that? I know priority number one is probably to get the job and it should be, but with your email and phone number everywhere that it's just spam goes through the roof for I and mean, that's what that's what i worry about well all right so question number one um i would maybe put in parentheses so you you list the job you know you list the name of the company when you work there then underneath it you put a line of what the company does and then the next line you have your job title that you had while you were there if it's now been upgraded i'd put in parentheses and i'd put now called whatever the director you know this is what it used to be but they now call it this you know because if nothing else that's going to get you more hits that's more keywords going in yeah. on your resume that may match whatever the new title is but you need to be sort of honest i mean you know we talked yes. about education remember there was a notre dame football coach who got fired two weeks after he took the job because he misrepresented what was on his resume 
So, you know, I'm a, I'm a former Boy Scout and former Scout Master and, you know, tell the truth. Yeah. The whole truth. Tell the truth, the whole truth, just not the god-awful truth. So, <laughs> um, as far as the second part, as far as getting your phone number and email out there, so you see it on my LinkedIn profile. You'll see it in three different places, the contact information, the about section, and in my banner. I don't get a lot of phone calls. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't get a lot of, now emails are easy because you can just hit, you know, it's easy just to hit spam, spam, spam if it's spam. And, you know, most of the services now, they do a pretty good job of, of knowing that any mail from this server goes there. I mean, I think Fang, in fact, is having an issue right now that some of the emails, the email I got this past week for yesterday's session went to my spam folder. So, you know, that's another thing. Be sure to check your spam folder every day because you never know you could you could be contacted by somebody who you've never heard of before and it could be the perfect job so you know take the time to go through your spam folder on daily basis i wish when you click on email it would immediately go to your spam folder and then once you clear it out then it would take you to your inbox you know just to sort of force you to those couple of habits i forget you know i use a yahoo email address and yahoo changed the way their spam folder works about a year and a half, two years ago. And now I don't know that there's any things in my spam folder and I forget to look frequently. And so I have to force myself. I actually have a tag on my monitor, spam, just to remind myself to go take a look. But I don't get a lot. And if you don't want to put your phone number out there, get a Google Voice number. It's free. And the Google Voice number then would forward, you just forward that to whatever phone you want people to uh you know, that you want to receive a phone call on. So that exists. Um, Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And have multiple, you know, so Aline just put down here, I get a lot of spam from my LinkedIn in mail, uh, LinkedIn email. I just ignore it. Right. I mean, you should, you should have two different email accounts. Okay. You should have your personal account that you send your friends and family. Uh, and then you should have your job search email account. And don't forget to check it when you do get a job because you never know who's going to be reaching out to you because everybody here is going to be trying to contact you through your job search email account. Um, you know, if you're like me, I've got about 12 or 14 different email accounts with all the different things I have going on, but they all funnel back into two or three different main accounts that I can keep a, keep handle on. So, um, you know, have a separate email account that you can use for that. Okay, any other questions? Don't be shy. If you really are, you can send it to me and I'll ask the question. The Something meantime, that came up yesterday in the uh, Atlanta group, they asked uh, about an executive, um, a marketing plan versus a bio. What's the difference? A marketing plan, Lee Heck Harrison pushes marketing plans. And I don't know about right management, some of these other outplacement firms, but a marketing plan lists eight or 10 companies, target companies that you're interested in. Well, that's fine to use as long as you're not meeting with one of those companies or somebody in one of those companies. Because if you go and you meet with one of those companies, you better make sure their company is number one on the list. And the other thing is to say, Oh, so target company, you want to work for here, but then you also want to work for our competition. You know, so you got to be real careful. Now, if you're just meeting with a friend or family, you can list companies, that's fine. But uh, they're effectively the same thing. It just depends. Do you add target companies? Or do you not add target companies? And I thought that was an interesting little thing. And the other thing that yesterday that came up that I thought was a great question, um, if you can form a accountability group they called them a power, I forget what they called it down there, some other term, but an accountability group where you're with three or four or five other people, no more than five, where you can have a Zoom call once a week and you can, or you can go meet at Starbucks or whatever, where you can hold each other's feet to the fire and go, well, you said last week you were gonna have five contacts. How come you only had four? What happened? You know, so it's a great way to, you know, share contacts. You don't have to be people in the same field. Just find four or five other people who are unemployed because it will help keep you motivated. Your significant other cannot be in your accountability group, okay? 
So yeah, I see smiles out there because people yeah. are already going, yeah, I know I can't. We do, we have job clubs, Jeff. Uh, we have eight of them and we have Eileen and Cynthia on the call right now. They're job club heads. Oh, good. Okay. So I think those are, I think they're great. Uh, you can, so your job clubs, that's another whole title that, you know, I'm, you know, I just call them accountability groups and that's, I guess every city's got a little bit different terminology for them. They're great. Congratulations. Thank you for uh, hosting those and keeping those going because those are wonderful to have. If you're not yes. on one, join one. And as I said at the beginning, we have openings right now. So, and they're for different regions. And you can contact Joyce Gibney for any of them. If you're not on one, be, get on one. <laughs> yes. Any um, other I would also uh, add that the job clubs have uh, really been very effective at supporting the FANG members who participate in their job searches, all aspects, including offline interview practice for a job coming up. And even in the time of uh, COVID, um, the, the members have been, uh, who, who take it seriously and do what they need to do, have been very successful at landing positions. Um, so things may be easier now, but there are a couple of clubs. Uh, the one I had, Cynthia, I, I think you're full, Long Island, and a couple of the clubs in New Jersey do have openings, which is something new for us. Um, because our wait list used to be very long. So that's the good news. If you're interested, um, uh, please come join us. And Leora, thank you for allowing time for this. Absolutely. And we actually, they were so popular. We had more than five people. We had eight to almost 10 people in each job club. Yeah. Don't do that. Split up and have two groups of five. You don't want to have 10 people in one group. That's too much. I mean, personally, I think that's just too much to be effective. You know, if you're looking I'll respectfully Spirit, agree to disagree because we have been very effective with those numbers. Okay. Uh, I had 14 at one point in my clubs. Oh, wow. Well, see, so yes. that's more to me than that's more of a networking group, not necessarily. No, 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 no. Right. We're not even going there. Yes. Maybe it's uh, the difference between New York and uh, Texas, but we, um, and I don't know how long your meetings were. Uh, ours go for two hours. Uh, some go for 90 minutes, but. Uh, but, but people did, I, we play so many folks. They were very effective. So people would cycle in and out and now we're down to a manageable number, but we still have around 10. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, if you don't have if you don't have one of these, you need to get, we'll get one of these, uh, and you have a little hole in it, so that way it goes right over your camera to remind you where to look at on your when you're uh, doing an interview. So, if you don't have one, go print off a little smiley face and uh, put it over your camera. Right. If you're on Zoom, you can try to position the speaker's picture near the camera, but on some other things, you may not be able to do that. Right. And other programs. Yeah, Zoom by far is the best thing out there right now. Yes. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Again, I recommend it for anybody, especially who did not have any outplacement after their job ended, that they join Career DFW, Career USA, because some of the coaches are actually ex LHH coaches. And it's actually like going to LHH, but I thought it was even better. It's you have five day, uh, four days a week now. It used to be five days a week, and on Fridays you have Q and A's, anything that you want to focus on. And even after every session, there's a Q and A. So anything that you have coming up during the week. And the pit crew, I haven't tried it yet, but I've seen their interview practice already, and it's amazing. It's like going through a real interview. You know, Especially people going people to will tell us that the interview was actually harder than the actual real interview and better for it to be harder during the practice interview than it is the real interview because then it's like, ah, this was easy. <laughs> Great. And it prepares you for a panel interview as well, which is the hardest on right. who to focus on, where to look, how to answer. And you get a chance to ask your questions at the end, just like you would at a real interview. 
Anything else? So if there's nothing else, I recommend that everybody save the chat, go down to the three dots and save it from there. And then you can save it onto any kind of document you want at the end. And please remember to network with um, your colleagues in the FANG, sorry about that. And um, contact Joyce if you want to volunteer and contact Joyce if you want to join any of the job clubs. We have eight job clubs right now.